Welcome to the beautiful city of Amsterdam, the backdrop for our next guest, the interview with Paige McFall, artist. Let's get to know this American lady and see what she's all about. Let's go and meet Paige. Hey, you're Hi, in your element. Welcome. So we do the art yeah. kissing. Oh, we want to wake up on three in Amsterdam. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. It's wonderful and great to see you. Nice to be in here. This beautiful, on this beautiful day and this beautiful location, which is perfect for you and, and filming. Yeah. I want to see what you've been up to and I want to tell everyone what Paige McFall is all about and how you got here. Let's go take a walk. Sounds good. So... <clears throat> We're in the middle of Amsterdam and we are going to walk to the location which is called Droog. And Droog in Amsterdam is a location for artists, it's a location for creative people, um, and it's also a location you're carrying your camera, which we'll talk about in just a sec, which is very important for, uh, you know, connecting with the artistic world. So I would like to talk first about, about your foundation, so I'm going to tell a little bit about your background and I'll do Chi Chi. Sure. Right. So you were born on Tuesday, August 5th in 1969 in Spokane, Washington. Am I saying it right? Spokane? Spokane, Spokane Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually a location which was named because of an American native tribe, which is very interesting and I, I can uh, get back to that when I talk to family about family names in your family. Um, the name means children of the sun, which I thought was interesting because it's so, it's so your family, I find, the way you live. It's known for Father's Day, the first Father's Day in 1910. Wow. You know, we learn new things every day on the Talk to Audrey show. <laughs> so, um, also, Year of Apollo 11, you know, um, Neil Armstrong. And we share the same birthday. Actually. Oh, really? Yes, really? We do. See, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> Bud Aldrin, Michael Collins. Um, what I love is a, a month before you were born, uh, the festival in Woodstock. Yes. You know, was and it was in the place called Bethel, and there were 400,000 people there. Did you? Did your parents tell you anything about that later on? Well, I learned about it. Yes, of course. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was a very iconic year, summer of '69. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's now I'm thinking Don Henley now. <laughs> <laughs> Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, the who, Grateful Dead, unbelievable. Uh, I'm using cheat seats. Uh, by the way, look at the beautiful day it is today in our city of Amsterdam, which means a lot to you because uh, obviously you have nestled uh, as an expat here um, in this uh, city. Yeah, so I this love. is a very rare sighting here. It's actually, very rare so. sighting, people. That's <laughs> so, like three quarters of the year it's raining and it's so pouring. And I have a great appreciation for the sun now. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. You and me both. Oh, gosh. You're married to the great John McFall, your husband, father, you know, principal dancer. There's much more to, to John than people know. Uh, you are the mother of Tallulah and Stella Blue. Yes. Uh, you're <laughs> mom, mom, as I say, to Rocco <laughs> and Zephyr. Yes. Okay, we'll, have, we'll come back to that, the family in detail. Um, I think also um, what's really interesting is your, your parents, obviously, with foundation. Uh, Mom, Marilyn? Yes. Wenatchee, Washington? Yes. Okay. Dad, Jim? Yeah. Um, I, don't know, I, didn't, I don't think we talked about where was your dad born? He was born in Washington State as well. Okay. Oh, huh. maybe Oregon. Okay. Oh, all right. Somewhere, somewhere in the there. U.S. Yeah, somewhere in the West Coast. <laughs> somewhere yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. Your sister? Cami. Cami. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Which is, you know, did you say divine one? Is that what it meant? Divine wind. Divine wind. Sorry. Yeah. And I love, I love, uh, you know, the, the names and the definitions of the names because things like that, you know, play a big part in your life. So what I'd like to know is we're going to talk, uh, obviously, in your foundation about your professional ballet uh, um, career, uh, but you're carrying a camera and it's not a, it's a special one uh, mm -hmm. because you're a, a renowned photographer, especially in the arts. You are an artist and you do so many different uh, things. You've been a teacher uh, also. You are also an expert in, a, you know, in pranic healing, which is something that we need to teach people about because a lot of people don't know what it means. And I love that we're walking in an iconic part of um, Amsterdam um, on this beautiful day because we're right around the corner from Droog, the artistic center, who have graciously allowed us to, to go ahead and share your story inside Droog. So let's go and do that. Wonderful. So welcome. 
welcome to Droog, which is a location that you know very well. Um, it's a beautiful location which I think matches who you are also. Um, lots of light, lots of creativity, uh, difference, different creative aspects. Um, why don't we take a seat and um, let's talk about a little bit more about your life. <laughs> So we've talked about your foundation, we talked about where you came from. I'd like to talk about the professional career and how it built up because you started at a very young age. Yes, I, um, I began taking ballet when I was five in our little hometown of Wenatchee, Washington. And um, I performed my first Nutcracker when I was five as well. So Unbelievable. In Wenatchee? In Wenatchee. There was a a uh, teacher there who would do productions for children. Well, it was like a children's ballet theater. And uh, I really credit her for bringing this artistic life, you know, to fruition in this small little town. Maybe we didn't have the best technique, but we all had this wonderful spirit of performance and doing what we love. We were on stage most of the time. So I grew up in that area and actually went on tour with a professional company when I was 10. We wow. traveled for two weeks around the state of Washington and performed the Nutcracker. And that was, that was just the best life for me. You know, it was something that I really missed when I came home. I was like, oh, that was such a wonderful way of living that it just carried forward into my, into my career. So is it normal that kids at the age of 10 go on tour? And what happens when you come back? No, it's not typical to uh, tour, tour with a dance company at 10 years old. And yeah, that was, that was a beautiful time, but it's not normal also when you come back because you've had this wonderful experience that you really can't relate that to other friends in grade school. Say, hey, I just toured all of Washington <laughs> State. I was right. up all night. I was with professionals. They were partying. It was, you know, something very that was... Very exciting, though. Yeah, very <laughs> exciting. But um, yeah, it's not, it's not typical. Mm. Does it mean that you become very, you know, you grow up very fast because you're talking about, you know, almost adult life? Um, is that something that you noticed because you started at such a young age that when you came back, you were maybe not the same as you know, your counterparts, your other childlike friends? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think being that passionate about something that young, you really don't fit in anyway into mm. the normal you know, atmosphere, a grade school, everybody's into, I would say for me, I found it a bit petty, but I was so passionate about dance mm. that um, I really didn't enjoy spending times like going to the mall or going to football games or I did it and it was nice but it, it really didn't I didn't feel like I fit in in the first place it's a whole different world you yeah. know obviously is that something that you notice now these days that when children uh, I almost don't want to call them children because they start young adults um, become experts at what they do and in the professional dance world um, obviously their grown-up life is completely different. It takes, you know, parents, I think, also um, to go ahead and guide them. Did, were your yeah. parents there because you went away by yourself? Yeah, I mean, my parents were really supportive. Mm. I, I really um, am grateful that they were so open and welcoming to what I did because they're not in the, in the dance world or art field. Mm. So, yeah, my, my parents were supportive. They helped me in so many different ways, but at the same time, they really didn't know what I was going through and I didn't really either because this was all new, but this was actually what I had to do. Mm. So there was this give and take about, I have to be a dancer, have to do this all day long. But at the same time, I wasn't like a normal child right? <laughs> you know, in that sense. But I really wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Like I look back and it was, I was professional at a young age and maybe I don't uh, express myself, you know, like I should have back then, like I say, oh, I should have been angry. I should have said something, but you know, uh, I was professional at no. a very young age. I think you're very professional. And I think it's, it's all about when you know better, you do better, you know? Yeah. So what happens, you come back at the young age and you're filming, you've been touring as a 10 year old um, in a professional world. And then what happened next in your career? Yeah, I, the next thing that happened that was, you know, very, you know, iconic for my career is that I got a scholarship to San Francisco Ballet School when I was 13. And so I would spend the summers at San Francisco Ballet School training and um, 
you know, broadening my, my artistry as a dancer. And then eventually ended up moving away from home at 15 to study full time at San Francisco Ballet School. So that was a big turning point to actually move away from home, be 24 seven with San Francisco Ballet, performing with them, studying. We did um, correspondence course for schooling and oh, wow. our math teacher was our piano player and <laughs> she taught us how to play poker. And, yeah. <laughs> Multi-talented. So we really didn't have also, uh, you know, it's just the first <laughs> correspondence courses. It wasn't like online learning now. No, and, no. You know, I, I don't think they teach poker now no, when they, they go on tour anymore. It, it was really good because we had real life <laughs> We have life skills, skills. Yes, life skills, skills that, life skills. Um, I really appreciate <laughs> But, you know, at, after spending a lot of time there, I really missed a balance because everybody was what I tend to say were bunheads because all they did was ballet, ballet, ballet. Right. And it got to be a bit too much and it loses the, the artistry. It became so technical. It became, you know, just... Um, Almost clinical yeah, also. Yeah, too much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we had beautiful training, beautiful teachers, amazing experience, mm. but I needed balance. Yeah. And so I went back home. Went to the prom, you know, had my last year in, wow. in Wenatchee in high school with friends that were were normal, right? You know, uh, in a sense. What is what does normal mean? Normal because means that they weren't um, they pursuing weren't their career. At, a professional at seventeen, at, at 17. Yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Which yeah. is which is a good thing. I think that you saw you know both sides of the professional world, and I think it's also important that when you continue in life. Um, you know what happens outside of the whole ballet world. So you're 17, so you've gone to prom, and then what? So when I was 17, my graduating year, I received a Presidential Scholar in the Arts Award um, and was the first in Washington State to do so. So that was uh, wow. quite a big deal at that time. Um, yeah, and I performed at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and uh, received a medal from President Reagan at the time. Amazing, so, <laughs> amazing. Um, but that was a beautiful beginning also because uh, I received a great scholarship. It helped me get going into my career. And um, at that time, I was also offered a professional contract to a ballet company. So I was 17. I had a professional contract to dance professionally. And... As soon as I graduated, I moved and was dancing. Where did you move to? I moved originally to Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. to dance with Ballet Met. Oh wow! And uh, started dancing that summer, and and that was at the age of seventeen. Age of seventeen, yes. So once again, discipline. Once yeah. again, you know, twenty four seven dancing, and you know. You spoke of obviously the start at, at almost at 10 and, and going on tour and then you're going on 17 and I see a continuation of a red line whereby that whole start of life as a teenager, um, even though you did get to, to go to the prom, once again kind of got put on the side. So at the time that you were 17 and were, was dancing at the Met, what happened with your private career? Were there other dancers 17 years old? Yes, um, with ballet, it is a young career because your body you know, has a limited time span, which is unfortunate. So we do start young. You do have to be ready to go at 17, 16. Uh, you should be ready to step into a company and, mm -hmm. and dance. So that's quite normal. You know, there's not many opportunities to mm -hmm. dance, so I was fortunate mm -hmm. to have a job. So that's, wow. And that's still the case today. That mm -hmm. There's so many dancers, but there's limited opportunity in terms of professional careers. And what is, we've, we've done a little bit of, you know, pre-talking uh, and things like that. You're saying the careers, well, what's the age of a professional dancer these days? What is the time span? Until what age are dancers dancing on a good level, high level? Yeah, I mean, it, you start the same age, 16, 17, 18, but it depends on what your repertoire is that you're dancing, mm -hmm. how long your, ba your body will be able to sustain a career. Mm -hmm. Depends on the stages, it depends on the, you know, all of the, di all different factors, your body makeup. Okay. Um, so I had a lot of difficulty with my feet, for instance, and I knew that was a, a, a point that was deteriorating as I was dancing, so. Wow. I got to a point where there were so many injuries and I can tell I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do artistically. So oh. I was like, I think I'll just step out at the peak rather than see it, see it. go down the other side. So wow. that's a, you know, it's a very personal thing, but mm -hmm. I think 40 is, is pushing it. 
<laughs> and that's and that's unique, I think, or not? Are yeah, there a lot of I mean, there are dancers who at dance that age at forty and even after that? But mm -hmm. it depends on, like I said, the repertoire. They may not do what they did when they were at their peak at mm. twenty or at eighteen. Uh -huh. But they may have more artistry and they may have more wisdom. So you would place them in a role that would, you know, support where they are physically. Mm. So are there? You know, obviously, we're in Amsterdam and we're in the Netherlands and in beautiful Droge. And, are there any dancers that you have connections with in the Netherlands, good friends with? We have uh, amazing dancers, Igone de Jong, and you know things like that. Are, are you? Do you? Yeah. Meet? Do you know each other? Do you? Yeah. Um, funny thing is, I was actually when we first moved here, we were neighbors with Igone de Jong, ah. and so there's we, no such thing as a coincidence. So we <laughs> lived in the same building. Oh and wow! It was a beautiful meeting because we we knew who she was, but she didn't really know who John was, mm -hmm. who was you know artistic director of Atlanta Ballet for 25 years and unbelievable worked you know worldwide internationally and. It was funny because one day she was. She said, "Oh, uh, you know, I would like to get you tickets to the ballet. Do you do you like ballet?" <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to have seen her face. What did John say? What does John and say? It was a dear funny John. moment because John had a very long pause. He was like. I do like ballet, but <laughs> I mean, or she said something like, have you been to the ballet? He's been kind. So uh, he was very kind and he said, well, actually, and he told her then. and then she had a very, you know, long pause about, yes. oh. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Anyway, it was a beautiful meeting and we became friends and, and um, I actually photographed her and mm -hmm. I photographed some other dancers at Het National, uh, Maya Makateli. And so it's been a wonderful, beautiful connection to you know, be with dancers because they're a special group of people. Like-minded, special group of yeah. people. I'd love to go to, obviously, the family, John and the girls, you know, in a minute. And I'd love to also, um, you know, continue about your creative part and the future, which we're going to do in the last segment. Segment. What do you think about ballet in the Netherlands? Um, you obviously are, you know, known in the circles and also friends with ballet people. What do you think about ballet today? What do you advise young dancers? You also are also a teacher, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's always evolving dance. You know, I think uh, NDT is one of the forefront companies, and they're they're doing. A, a Can you tell people what work. NDT is? NDT for, Netherlands mm -hmm. Dance Theater. Right for those and, international watchers. Yeah, and um, you know they're on the forefront of a lot of contemporary dance. But I do have to say, for classical dancers, you it's. It's very difficult to go into a company and just do classical work. It's such a variety now. You have to be able to do more contemporary works. So you have to be able to be barefoot, maybe speak now. So it's, oh, wow. it's evolved quite a bit into being a very well-rounded artist. Okay. And the, and the obvious reason for that, is it obvious, is that you know all-rounded creates more work? Well, I think it's just the time, uh, you know, it's, there's what we call, you know, companies that we know that they, that's what they specialize in, like the Bolshoi Ballet does okay. Swan Lake, Giselle, they mm -hmm. do, these are, you know, pieces that are really, you know, well known for those companies, but yes, other companies will do those works, but they also have, uh, you know, other ballets by new choreographers, by new voices or old voices that are, you know, something that's, you know, iconic. Mm. So it's a good mix. So obviously one of the natural questions I'm going to ask is who are some of your most uh, precious and, and um, you know, ballet dancers that you look up to and maybe have even worked with? Hmm. I'd have to say choreography wise, I don't have a favorite because I like a mix too. It's like your mood, like what do you want to watch? What are you into? What are you feeling? But I found uh, Alexander Ekman is very like whimsical and there's not a lot of humor in dance mm. and so he has these wonderful moments and um, theatrical ballets that um, really push the limits mm. so I, I really admire Alexander Ekman's work right now could you tell people who have no idea and knowledge about ballet who Alexander Ekman is he's a choreographer that um, is is well he went to NDT he was here at National uh, mm -hmm. Netherlands Dance Theater but he's been doing a lot of work in um, the Royal Swedish Ballet. And um, yeah, I mean, you can go on Instagram, Ale and, and Alexander just, Ekman. Just Google, Google, Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? So, um, but you have to see his work. And, you know, John brought him into Atlanta mm. uh, when he was director. So I actually met Alexander, spent time with him before that, before mm. I've, 
you know, got to really see the depth of his work. Right. But he, he did a piece for Atlanta Ballet, mm -hmm. and um, it was a bit difficult to, you know, bring this new work, new ideas, new uh, innovative work to Atlanta. But it's been after it's presented there, it's been done all over the world. It's one of his most iconic pieces, and it's, uh, it, it's just really... Um, a full full body of work in, in so many different ways. You just need to see it. So we've spoken about your husband, John, who has an amazing career himself as a choreographer and a dancer. And I'd love to talk about the girls in a minute. So Lula and Stella Blue, those names, when I first heard them. Um, I, I would like to ask your opinion for dancers who may be watching us and listening to us because we're also on Spotify and iTunes about what you think is the best suggestion and advice for this time and trying to pursue a career because dance has changed, as you said. Yeah, I think, I think the main uh, suggestion for any artist or dancer is to actually be uh, involved in your world, like eat different foods, travel, get a sense of the world because that will bring so much richness, richness into your artistry. Mm -hmm. So whether you want to dance more contemporary, more ballet, you still need to be an artist internally. So nice. with that, you really need to cultivate so many different aspects of yourself. And so that's my suggestion for any, anybody pursuing uh, a career in the arts. So grow in, in the most, the broadest sense of the world, yeah, travel, become worldly yes, and travel, everything. Yes, travel, go to exhibits, watch movies, do, do things that inspire you, read books, uh, you know, really uh, tap into many, many layers of right. life. Right, many layers of life. So, well, that's a natural flow into suddenly being in Amsterdam. Nothing <laughs> happens suddenly, but I think that I would love to know what happens is with your creative life, obviously we have a rich history of ballet uh, and, and other cultural arts. We're in Droog right now, which is a cultivation and a place where um, you know, creativity uh, assembles. What was it like coming here? To Amsterdam? Yeah, oh, okay. or even leaving the yeah. United States. Oh. I was so happy to leave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're happy to have you. You know, we're happy to have you. So did you did you land here? Um, I'll tell a little, little secret is that we uh, helped a little bit in relocation. When I say we, it's the company, my day job. Um, so what was it like? I, I have a feeling it was very easy. I mean, I know a little bit more. Can, we, can you tell? Well, I think as being an artist, you're not, you don't really fit in and in, in society in a lot of different ways. People mm -hmm. expect you to be this or to be that. And you say, oh, you're a dancer. And they kind of look at you like, what do you really do? Oh, yeah. yeah. What's your day job? Yeah. So, you know, I didn't find the appreciation in, in little things as much in the States as I did when I toured and was in Europe. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a different pace, a different appreciation, uh, a more worldly view than what I experienced in the U.S. Mm. And I think people are willing to explore, to be open to different things here. Um, so I really appreciated being here. It wasn't really um, a shock. It was, it was just a wonderful time to be, to explore, to... Mm -hmm. Softly land. Yeah, kind of. yeah. Is it also because I, I mean, obviously my family lives in the U.S. and I, I've spent quite a few years there. Um, it was less difficult than it is now, I find that the arts is not that accessible in the United States and it's extremely expensive. So if you don't uh, get affected or affected is a wrong word, if you don't, aren't able to appreciate, you know, the ballet, the concert halls, even just regular pop concert tickets or things like that, then how can you get exposed? That was the word I was looking for. How can you learn? It's more accessible here in the Netherlands and in Europe. Yeah, I find that it's, it's more part of daily life mm. here. It's not separate. Mm -hmm. And I did feel in the States it's, it's more separate and it is, it's not as accessible in terms of, you know, being able to be a young person and talk about it, but, but be with your young group of people as mm -hmm. a natural way of being. Mm -hmm. So it's like people here hang out at the museum flying, they may go in, they see it every day, there's music, there's right. concerts, there's free concerts at the Concert Gebouw. And, mm. and you Amazing. know, you're interfacing with people who are artists at young ages here. Right. Good yeah. point. Good point. Well, I think that for our last segment, which we love to change it up a little bit, we're going to talk about where you are right now in your career. Obviously, from being a, 
you know, a, a ballet a dancer, a professional, you know, worldwide having danced for great kings and queens and all kinds of dignitaries. Uh, you have a new career, uh, actually it's been around for a while, in photography. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love to talk about the photography career and also about your new career, which we won't say anything about yet, but we'll tell you in the new room. Let's go. Okay, sounds good. So you gave advice to younger dancers and younger artists and did you give yourself that advice? Because suddenly you made a huge jump into two new special parts of your career. Can you tell us? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I think that is uh, what brings life to me, is to travel and to meet new people and to experience all these uh, amazing cultures. Because, uh, you know, we're here so little on this earth and it's mm. like, you know, you have this opportunity to to broaden your picture and when you do that i think you really become aware of what what's important to you and what what really matters nicely said nicely put so let's make a natural bridge what does really matter what are mm. the things that matter in your life what are you doing right now i know you're well i wouldn't say dabbling goodness me i i you're a, an amazing photographer and you're involved in pranic healing. Let's start with that because I know yeah. that a lot of people may not know what pranic healing means and what is your role? Yeah, well, pranic healing came into my life um, and it had a profound effect, meaning that it opened the world of energy to me in all different ways, in subtle ways, in very dramatic ways, but um, Pranic healing is, uh, was developed by Master Choa Kaksui, and he's the modern day founder of Pranic Healing. Mm -hmm. And what he's done is taken old Eastern um, uh, medicines and different uh, thoughts about healing mm -hmm. and put it into a, a syllabus that's for every, every person for now. Mm -hmm. So anybody can learn it, anybody can apply it, but it's... Um, it's a very, very simple way of applying energy to help the body actually heal itself. So, um, but that's a simplification of what this big picture that he brought into my life. Um, there's energy for your home. There's energy for your, you know, for your work, for your mm -hmm. children, for every aspect of your life is energy. And it's through your thoughts, through your speech and through your actions that actually manifest in your life. So if you ask me where I am now, I'm, I'm aware of these things. Once you're aware of it, it's like you cannot not see it. Mm. So I'm living in a realm of seeing and being aware energetically of how I affect others, how I affect my family, how they affect me. You're present, you're more present yeah, than and, ever. Yeah, and so it really, you know, that's what matters for me and that's, Kind of how I'm seeing things through my photography. Mm -hmm. I think um, what what it's made me aware of is kind of my uh, my hashtag is the magic in between. And, oh, nice! And I that's like that. the magic in between is like the special moments on the way to somewhere, mm. or when you're just sitting with your children in the car. We tend to have these wonderful magical moments mm -hmm. where we're speaking, but it's not that we're at the place we're going, but these beautiful moments. In, in between, between. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna remember now. Yeah. Does it does it mean that someone um, like me, someone who's watching, teaches you to become more aware about what you do? So if you go to a pranic healer, what happens? Well, there's different aspects of pranic healing. Um, there's the the um, like practical side of actually helping the body heal itself, but there's a spiritual side mm -hmm. of of you know, having a deeper level of spirituality, which I find is also very connected to my artistry as a dancer, mm -hmm. because there's these uh, moments that come from something beyond us. And so I've always been very inquisitive of why do I feel this way? Why am I so driven to do what I do? And, and, and learning about spirituality in a deeper sense has, has made me understand everybody's purpose. Everybody has a calling. Everybody has something that they, they bring 
to to the world. Mm -hmm. um, but as somebody coming for a pranic healing session, um, a pranic healer would, um, it's no touch. We work on what we call the etheric body, okay. which is maybe in lay terms, the aura. Mm -hmm. And so the pranic healer learns how to take away maybe diseased energy that might be stuck in the body that doesn't allow the natural flow of energy through the body mm -hmm. to promote health. Okay. So a balance of a proper flow of energy brings health. So what a pranic healer would do in a session would be to assess the energy that surrounds the body. Mm -hmm. they, you learn how to feel and um, sense the energy. So it's, it's very basic skills that anybody can learn, but I think we've just lost touch of how to feel energy. And once you learn this, it's, uh, you can't stop, <laughs> stop feeling it, I would say. But basically what we would do is assess what's going on in your energetic body. We work on the energy body. Mm. So we would take away maybe diseased and dirty energy that mm -hmm. might be congesting an area. And then we would project a little bit of fresh prana or energy to that area to help it heal, to assist in the healing. What does prana mean? Prana means energy or life force. I'm wondering if because you've learned and, and you know how to, to put more energy, positive energy in your life. Are you? Is it something that's constantly on in your head? Yes, it's. Mm. Um, once I had this uh, class, or I learned learned the techniques and furthered my studies in pranic healing, it's it really altered everything that I see, everything that I do, and it's like, uh, for instance, like this table began as a thought. Nice. I like so that. So it didn't come to being. Everything around us that you see was a thought. Mm. And if you think about that in your life, you really become aware of what you're thinking, what you're saying, and how you're acting. And because it manifests into the physical world. So I'm, I'm very aware now of maybe I don't do it right all the time, of course. You know, you have your moments. But at least I catch myself and say, oh, I should have done that differently or better. So you've gone a step further because now you travel for pranic healing. Yes, we, we actually moved to the Netherlands. Um, I was offered a position to assist Master Hector Ramos with his work. And uh, they had moved to the Netherlands and said, would you like to have this opportunity? And of course, immediately it was a yes. Mm -hmm. But um, John, my husband, had also transitioned from his job and... Uh, you know, we thought, what a wonderful opportunity to live in another country, another culture for our, especially our girls. Yes. But we, um, yeah, we we're more than happy to to come here. I love it. And so now you, I know you go to Rome. Um, is it constantly Rome, or is it the whole world, or do you? Are there certain locations? Yeah. Well, right now, Master Hector is located in Rome, mm. so I'll travel there and um, spend time to, you know, discuss work and and be there. So it's. Um, yeah, I'm traveling a bit, but I've also met so many amazing people from around the world because the pranic healing community um, is is international. So it's uh, we're online. Master Hector has online programs, and I manage Google. Google. <laughs> <laughs> I manage his uh, online programs, and so it's uh, it's a worldwide um, connection. Amazing! It's something definitely that I will have to learn more about, and I'll be reading up ever since I prepared for the interview. So it's it's one of the many jobs because there is another job I don't consider passions a job. It's something you're very good at. Uh, you constantly carry your camera, special camera, around. Uh, you've been speaking to our dear uh, cameraman, creative director, all morning about you know. It's to me, it's a different language about cameras, about lenses, about all kinds of different things. Tell us about your beautiful work because I know that you photograph your family. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, Tallulah and Stella Blue and John um, in a certain special way. How did you roll into, literally, into <laughs> this new passion of yours? Uh, well, I've always taken photos and collected postcards throughout my, my life. And um, I actually photographed when I was dancing and would always mm. have a camera with me. But I, I think it's, uh, again, these, these moments to capture these special moments that I see and it's also very funny that it's, I'm not speaking, but it's very visual. It's like ballet has the same frame as the right. stage, proscenium, 
but um, there's some beautiful moments that I look for. So um, I think it just helps clarify also what I'm in search of. Mm. So I am in search of these beautiful moments, the magic in between. <laughs> it's amazing. The sun so, is shining on you straight away. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but it began really personally with my children because more intense, I would say, because they, I just was so taken by how my children are so raw and so wonderfully alive in, in every moment that mm -hmm. you forget to see things. Mm. So I would photograph them in all of their, you know, moments. And so it really, um, yeah, it really took off then. You created yeah. a, a story, just like you do in dance and photography. You're being very modest because I know that your work is known. You photographed one of our great actors, Pierre Bokma, one of our wonderful dancers, Igone, as we spoke of before. Um, where can we find your work and where are you going to the future? Hmm. Well, right now I, I post some of my work on Instagram, um, mm -hmm. but I found... Uh, it's more personal for me. It was, mm. I think it's transitioned. It was more outwardly. And now I think I'm doing things that I love and finding nice. more, you know, things, my voice uh, in that sense. So I do sell my work so people can, you know, message me and I sell my work and I do a lot of portraits um, and, and, you know, gigs if people want me to do special events, mm -hmm. of course. But for now, I'm really exploring what matters like what we talked about oh wonderful so we'll definitely put information of Paige, you know everywhere on social media so you cannot miss her <laughs> um i think it's wonderful that you have um a life that evolves constantly and um of course i always end with asking some questions whereby you know people who don't know who you are get another idea but they're questions they go all over the place so um not fair, but you have to choose. Sure. Pranic healing work, dancing, again, worldwide, photography all over the world. So I have to choose one. You have to choose one. Oh, I would <laughs> say pranic healing. Why did I not? That doesn't surprise <laughs> me. It's something you can use. Um, do you have a favorite song with meaning? Music to me is an important thing, or a piece of music that you yeah. dance to or something. I know? think uh, I think pieces of music I've danced to are are very special or dear. But it's funny because your body automatically does the steps. You'll mm. hear the music and you immediately are there. But um, I, I don't know. I have I don't really have a favorite. It also is my mood. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> gosh. But I prefer classical music. Right, I'd have to right. say I prefer classical music. You wake up and you go to sleep with classical music, or when it's on, it's always classical. Um, not always. I think if I'm in a happy, playful mood, I do more Latin salsa. Ah, there you so go. If I'm do you with, dance Latin salsa? I, I, I do. Like, you probably do. Not Yes, I, I love <laughs> to. Um, if I'm with my girls, it's more Lana Del Rey. Oh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. And Billie Eilish. I yes. love Billie. Um, You're on, on you know, point. No there's... pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> But if it's classical, I, I like I just like a, a wide range. But right. I, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, favorite place you have lived or have yet to live? Mm. I really love Italy. Mm. I really I love the people. I love that they have passion mm. in almost everything they do in right. their food, in their cappuccino, in their mm -hmm. in their Very just important. out being out. You know, you'll see women discussing the fashions and the in the you know in the storefront you know and it's just there's so much beauty mm -hmm. that i appreciate and it resonates with me so i really love italy but we've spent a lot of time in tropea for summer holidays with our family wow and that's become a very special place to us and you know so that would be you know a special place but italy in general nice is, is do you think nice. you'll end up in italy or do you oh, think yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah of course yeah of course <laughs> check <laughs> john to lula so listen um the other thing that I wanted to know is, is uh, and it's sometimes not fair because I ask it more often, is the, most pers the person who's influenced you most in your life? Hmm. Well, there's so many lifetimes that I've lived already, but mm. um, I, I, I would have to say that the teachings of Master Choa Koksui have really um, 
you know, brought a deeper the founder. meaning. Yeah, the founder, a deeper meaning to our whole purpose here mm -hmm. and why we're here and what what do you do with that? You know, so that's been something that I was like, oh my gosh, the whole life, this is what you feel it, but you yeah. don't really know where it's coming from. So yeah. You just made the perfect ending to me because it makes <laughs> us more aware. And for me, that is the most important thing. It's also something of the times, these times mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I know it's something that you pass on through your family. Yeah. I want to thank you for spending the day with us today. Sure. Um, and for showing uh, the strong woman that you are and the force and the diversity and the creativity that you can have and that you can have it all. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate... Uh, having known you for a little bit longer and i hope that everyone will get to know you a little bit more um, and i wish you all the luck and i hope that everyone sees that the energy that you exude that it's a very special one oh thank you for having me thank Touched. you Paige. thank you Likewise. <laughs>